Good afternoon. I'm Tom Gardner, a member of the Silicon Valley Technology History Committee and organizer of today's webinar. Our committee organizes events, now webinars, to capture the history of technologies originating in Silicon Valley. Lockheed actually predates semiconductors in the Valley and arguably is responsible for the Valley. Today's webinar is our third on Lockheed's contributions to the Valley. If you'd like to learn more about our webinars, go to www.siliconvalleyhistory.com. 31 years ago this Friday, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched and has been orbiting the Earth every 95 minutes, about 17,000 miles per hour and is still working today, 31 years after launch. A telescope is a complex system that isn't much use if it can't be continuously pointed in the right direction, repeatedly, held steady, and in this case, serviced for repair and upgrade. That was Lockheed's mission and the subject of this webinar, the Hubble Space Telescope. We're not gonna to spend too much time on the lens system and the five instruments but today instead focus on the design and control of the spacecraft. We have three veterans from Lockheed today. They have over hundred years of experience with Lockheed. They will walk us through the Hubble spacecraft history, starting with a background. We'll then go into detail on the pointing control system. We'll discuss integration, test and launch, and then the post launch checkout and summary. And finally go into Hubble product. Our first speaker is Jim Carlock, are you there, Jim? I'm here. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you for putting this on and uh, and doing all the work to get everybody everybody going here. Uh, I'm Jim Carlock. I came to Lockheed in 1967 as a control systems engineer and uh, worked on a variety of different space ground system, all related. Then in 1987, I became the program manager for the Hubble for the last three years of the development contract. Uh, the uh, history of the Hubble, a lot of people point to a paper written in the late 40s by Dr. Spitzer advocating an orbiting observatory and laying out a lot of the arguments for why that would work. If I fast forward through the start of the uh, US space program, the formation of NASA, some uh, earlier smaller observatories that were launched. And then in 1977, a lot of work by NASA, along with the uh, science community and the industry partners like Lockheed to define what a space telescope should be. There was a competition for who would build the various parts and uh, we won the spacecraft portion. And in 1977, Congress uh, authorized funding and so uh, we started in late 1977 to work on the telescope. Most of this presentation will focus on the time between the start of the funding and the uh, final checkout and completion of this development contract in 1990, uh, since this is the work that was done here in Sunnyvale. And uh, between 1977 and 1989, we were designing, uh, building, testing, and 1989, everything was completed. We shipped the telescope uh, from Sunnyvale to Kennedy Space Center. Uh, as luck would have it, we shipped uh, a few days before the Loma Prieta, work, uh, Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, we had to get the telescope at Kennedy, set up again with the test equipment, verify everything had survived the transportation and was ready to launch. 1990. Uh, the shuttle Discovery launched the Hubble and was on orbit. Uh, by the end of that year, all the initial checkout of all the ground systems and the flight systems were completed and the development, our development contract ended. 1993 was the first of several planned servicing missions. Uh, the, uh, the plan was every three years or so to go back to the shuttle to replace any failed parts, to upgrade technology as it came available, and also boost into, uh, to make up for the drag. The Hubble itself has no propulsion system. 
Uh, as Tom pointed out, uh, we just passed 30, 30th anniversary last uh, uh, April, and it's still operating today. Now, there's a lot more detail on what Hubble has done on the NASA site, specifically the Space Telescope Science Institute and the Goddard uh, site. Uh, what Lockheed brought to the table to work on this, we had a lot of experience building and testing large spacecraft and operation support. We had the facilities that were already built and checked out to accommodate large spacecraft, and thermal vacuum, uh, acoustics, and so on. Uh, we had a lot of experience integrating these optical payloads, uh, not, not Hubble, but others. And uh, what we did, of course, the facilities were available and we brought test teams from some of these other programs who were able to hit the ground running. So there was a, uh, a risk reduction. Another uh, capability we brought was a history of precision pointing control, uh, which was definitely a heart of the Hubble. Uh, while it's a totally different uh, control system that we'd used the past, in the past, we uh, first team over who could bring all that experience to bear. Uh, to help with the pointing control system, we had an already developed flight computer that we could use. And also the electronics had been developed that interfaced with this flight computer, another uh, risk reduction for the program. Uh, this flight computer, you would say, would be uh, primitive by today's standards. It uh, took about one microsecond to do an ad and had about 24 kilobytes of RAM memory. Uh, the, the computer box had redundant power supplies, redundant CPUs, and some redundant memory uh, for long life. Some of the new requirements for Hubble, of course, it had to be serviceable by a suited astronaut. All the electronics and other boxes had to be replaceable on orbit. Uh, while we were used to doing testing in clean rooms, we had to go one better for Hubble class in clean room uh, to preserve performance in the ultraviolet. So everybody had to have bunny suits, uh, full bunny suits to work on this. The third thing that was new to a lot of us was that uh, since the Hubble was totally unclassified and NASA did like to publicize all the good work, uh, we were expected to deal with public relations and the, and the media. The initial setup for the program, it was a combination NASA and ESA program. ESA brought the solar arrays and one of the five scientific instruments. Uh, there was also uh, the independent uh, mission planning and science operations, the Space Telescope Science Institute on the campus of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, they were the interface with the science community and did the mission planning, which was then passed on to Goddard to actually operate the spacecraft. Goddard and others brought the other four science instruments. Our contract was with the Marshall Space Flight Center in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, there were two contracts, one to Lockheed to build the equipment section and to do the system integration. Uh, one to Perkin Elmer to do the optical telescope and find guidance sensors. And of course, NASA Kennedy was launch operations. NASA Johnson was the shuttle operations and also the home of the astronauts. So what was our responsibility? We had to do the equipment section design and development, and that's pointing control in the flight software, uh, structures, the mechanisms, and the thermal control. We had to do the command and telemetry systems, the communication systems and antennas, and the electric power system, except for the solar arrays. Uh, all the individual pieces were designed, test, sent to the assembly, along with all the hardware from the other contractors. Uh, this was put together, tested, uh, including environmental tests and shipped to the launch base for launch operations. Uh, we had to make sure our responsibility, make sure that everything fit with the ground operations, with the shuttle, uh, with the astronauts as far as servicing and with the launch base operations. Uh, just some facts to put it in context, the uh, Hubble's nearly 50 feet long, a little over if you open the front aperture door, weighs about 25,000 pounds. A typical operation takes about 2000 watts of power maybe two microwaves worth. Uh, it's, the back end is, is about 14 feet in diameter. And uh, the uh, lens, uh, 
telescope for you camera buffs, it's about an F24 system. As I mentioned, this is just a cartoon showing that the Hubble design had to uh, be capable of servicing. And uh, you can see not only did you have to provide handholds for the astronauts, you had to provide doors that they could open and each of the components had to be removable and serviceable. So in summary, we had, a, we had some risk reduction things between our proven facilities and the proven uh, computer, and we brought experienced teams to bear. Now, the next two speakers will bring some of that experience here. They were there from the beginning of the proposal all the way through launch and support thereafter. Uh, Dr. Hugh Doherty will be the first, and he'll talk about the controls, which was the system that was most uh, tied to the performance of the uh, spacecraft. Many, many have used uh, gyros and uh, reaction wheels before, but nothing to this uh, level of, of um, accuracy. He had to do everything to millionths of a degree. So I'll turn it over to Hugh. Thank you, Jim. It was a great presentation. Uh, the control system was uh, my responsibility from 1975 through 1989. Uh, I came back and worked on it again when we had the solar ray disturbance effect. And then when I retired, I worked for them for three years uh, helping the ground station. So Hubble is considered to be a cosmic time machine because it allows the system to point anywhere in the sky that, it would, that they would, astronauts want us to go. So let's look at the picture up in the right-hand corner. There is, I put in a coordinate axis because it makes it easier to talk about it when we have some axes. So the V1 axis is along the bore side of the telescope looking out towards the sky. And the V2 and V3 axis are in the focal plane of the telescope. So all the images are formed in the V2, V3, we, we point with the V1 axis. So looking down at the, the sketch here, the little cutaway, uh, the light comes in through the telescope. The telescope has a field of view that's plus or minus about a quarter of a degree. It comes back into the, the primary mirror. It bounces from the primary mirror up to the secondary mirror, comes back through the, the primary mirror, which has a 16 inch hole in the center of it, to allow the light rays to get through. And it forms an image back here at the focal plane of the system, which is four and a half feet behind the primary mirror. So you notice all the electronics, uh, the science instruments and so on are clustered around that point. So what you get at the focal plane is a picture just like your camera takes. And so no camera gets the whole picture. So the whole picture frame is divided up into pieces. The, the wide field planetary camera, which is down here below on, is called a radial instrument at the minus the, the V3 axis here, uh, gets the primary portion. It has the center field of view. It's got a 160 by 160 arc seconds field. The, uh, sec the, the axial instruments share the rest of the annulus around that and the outer annulus of the picture, because it's a circular image. The outer annulus is shared by the fine guidance sensors. So the fine guidance sensors, they have a between about 10 and 13.8 arc minutes. And the, 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 the V2, V3 axis is the, v, is the focal plane. So the way the fine guidance sensors work is they look out through the telescope and they are sharing the image that's off axis. And so they give us the information of how much the to change the pointing to put their image right on uh, perpendicular to the bore side of the telescope. So now in terms of the pointing, we have to do jitter to 0 0.007 arc seconds. So let's just talk about what an arc second is. A circle has 360 degrees in it. The uh, idea then is uh, like a clock has a circle face and has 12 hours in it. So the circle the hour, each hour is broken up into 60 minutes and then 60 seconds. So an analogy with that, what we do is take every degree and break it up into 60 arc minutes because it's arc on a circle. And then each minute is broken up into 60 arc seconds. And so if you multiply 60 times arc seconds around going around a circle, the RMS they, with the requirements, not plus or minus, because even though the telescope is moving up and down, we really have a number that's what's called RMS. So you square the, the values that you get between the plus and minus. You take the mean over like a second, and then you take the square root of that. And that is the requirement. It'll be a positive number. That's about two millionths of a degree. We have to return to the target within 
10 milli arc seconds. We're going to talk about milli arc seconds because point, to get into point zero ones, and so it takes a, a, a little thought here in terms of everybody looking at it. But this is essentially 10 over a thousand. So at one over a thousand is a milli arc second. And so therefore, you get a, that's also RMS, and that's about three millionths of a degree. So now let's get back to the control system part, the, the vehicle. So there's five parts to it, the aperture door, which you can see up here in the, in the right-hand side too. And then there's the high gain antenna, which is pointing to the uh, TDRA satellites up in synchronous orbit. And then there's the solar array. And then there's the Lockheed bus, which is basically this frame around the telescope. And then there's the telescope assembly inside. So now how does Hubble work? So the, there's a reaction wheel inside of here. And by conservation of momentum, when you spin the reaction wheel, the vehicle spins in the opposite direction. So the vehicle is obviously very large. So it, it has the, the dominant, what's called moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is re, its resistance to the, it being accelerated angularly. Just like when you step on your scale, the scale, your, your mass on the scale is the acceleration, uh, that, that the uh, resistance to the acceleration of gravity. And so that gives you your weight. So the same thing here, we have a moment of inertia, which is this resistance. And the, and the telescope also has its resistance, uh, its moment of inertia, which is its resistance to acceleration. So now you can see we have to get the, the reaction wheel into the, this vehicle. So it has to fit in, inside here. So we have a size, weight, and power constraint on the system. The, uh, the, the, me the method now that we're gonna use is we're going to size, and we'll talk about in the next, in the next thing, we're gonna size the reaction wheel so that we can maneuver the vehicle at a rate that's compatible with what needs to be done in the in this system. The second thing that needs to be taken care of in a thing is the structural stability of the system. The uh, control system cannot stabilize modes if they're in its bandwidth. The bandwidth is about one hertz, one cycle per second. And the solar array then has to be put, since it, you can't stiffen this up, it just has a boom. We put this about 10 times lower than that at a 10th of a hertz. Well, that, that takes care of the stability problem, but what it introduces now is a problem that we can't put in steps into the system because that will excite the solar rays and they will start to oscillate. And we're only allowed one milli arc second for the solar ray jitter. So that means that we have to have a very smooth profile in the system. Talk more about this in a minute. Uh, the, the system then also has the optical telescope assembly inside of it. The optical telescope assembly attaches with the main ring and Cliff's going to show you this picture later with the, with the uh, primary mirror inside of it. So the main ring then attaches to three points to the uh, spacecraft. This is the stiff section of the spacecraft. The, uh, the back end here is just a cap, you know, a sheet metal type cap, or, and this is another, just a cap covering it. So all the strength in the vehicle is here in the, uh, the, science, the system support module. You can see how thick it looks in terms of, of its uh, support. So there, there is the attach point. It turns out since the reaction wheels are in the bus, the, the Lockheed built spacecraft, and the gyros and, and star sensors are put on the optical telescope to get the best image we can, the best jitter, uh, it is right close to the focal plane. So we're on the underside of the optical bench, which holds the three, uh, the four uh, axial instruments. And the, the, we make that 18 Hertz because it turns out that it, it, the, it's more difficult to stabilize it when you're in two different bodies. So the, there is other equipment on board. There's uh, seven sun sensors, for example, make sure the sun doesn't get in the aperture door. We have two sun sensors that are on either side to close it. So now how well is the control system doing? Well, this is the on orbit budget we have for it. We have four and a half milli arc seconds that we've allocated out of the seven milli arc seconds for the control system. So this is the three axis jitter before they come up with servicing mission four, which is the last mission in 2004. And the gyros and the RMS basis is are looking like this, okay? We're nominally meeting the requirements. It's still uh, a little above here, but there, there, we, there were only three gyros left in the mission. So they had to replace the gyros in order to keep the system uh, going and hopefully into like it's going now for 30 years. So when they put the new gyro in, you can see when the gyros are working better in, in the, at this pace. So they're, they're running down about three. So we're handily meeting that requirement. So 
then we have to figure out what are design two requirements for the, the reaction wheels and the gyroscopes. So I've capitalized the ones that are given to us by Marshall Space Flight Center, which was the center that directed the uh, telescope. So the science then, we have to track Halley's Comet at a rate of 21 degrees per hour. So that means that what's gonna set the gyro is gonna have two modes. It's gonna have a science mode and a maneuver mode. So we're gonna set the gyro so that it can measure this. And so we set its rate at 30 degrees an hour. But like we mentioned before, there's 12 hours on a clock and there's 360 degrees. So in one hour, you move 30 degrees an hour. So the hour hand on your clock is 30 degrees an hour, which is the rate on the gyro in the science mode. We have to maneuver 90 degrees in 18 minutes. So since we're gonna to have to shape it, we can't use a constant acceleration, but if we go with a constant acceleration, just to get the bottom, the least acceleration I could have uh, for nine minutes and then decelerate for nine minutes, it takes about half of this value. The rest of the value on the acceleration is, is, a, is due to the fact that we need it for torque and we need to have it for controlling the other devices on all. Uh, this turns out to be what's equivalent to 10 uh, milli micro radians, which is one over 100,000. I haven't talked about a radian is, but a radian, if you take a circle and you divide its circumference by its radius, so the circumference is two pi times the radius divided by the radius, you come out with two pi, which is just a number. And so if you're gonna do calculations, you have to have a dimensionless angle. And so the two pi around the circle is the same as 360 degrees, which is the same as 1.3 million arc seconds. So therefore we can, there's an equivalence. And so we can turn it into this dimensionless angle. And so now if we wanna know how much torque does it take to do this? Well, the, the moment of inertia, the resistance of the telescope, the body to the being accelerated is 80,000. And the acceleration we wanna put on it is one over 100,000. You multiply the two together and we come out with eight tenths of a Newton meter in the, the uh, SI system, the international system of unit, units, is, which is what Marshall wants us to work to, or it's 60,000 slug foot squared in the British American units. Uh, they're all still the same ideas. It's just who has what measuring stick when you go to fit making it. The, uh, the torque then is, is uh, 0.8 Newton meters or six tenths. And so we're gonna put a 12 bit uh, a digital to analog converter to drive the wheel, that gives us roughly 2,000 plus and 2,000 minus increments that we can divide this in, into. So you can see that we're going to have a, a minimum torque capability of about four tenths of a, a milli Newton meter. So it's going to be a very fine uh, torque quantization we can give it, and that keeps the profile real smooth to uh, keep from exciting the arrays or anything. So now we get back up here. If we have to set the vehicle so that the inertia of the, the moment of inertia times the rate of the, the, uh, the vehicle plus the moment of inertia of the wheel times its rate is going to be e to equal to zero. So we're gonna to have to fit the wheel inside the, the, the telescope. So we're gonna use, since we liked one over 100,000 here, we're gonna make the inertia of the wheel one over 100,000 times smaller. So now it's gonna be like eight tenths of a kilogram, what's gonna be like six tenths of a slug foot square. So as you can see, the, the way you make a, a precision pointing vehicle is you take a very massive object like the Hubble and you tickle it with a feather to get it to move. So we're, we've, everything we can do is 100,000 times smaller than whatever the inertia and so on of the bigger vehicle are. So now we have to figure out, uh, we do, we're doing the smooth torque profiles. We use one minus the cosine type shape waves. The jerk is the derivative of acceleration. And so we integrate the first jerk pulse and we get ourselves up to acceleration. The second jerk pulse stops the acceleration and we go to constant rate. And so now we, we got to figure how, how much, how, how much uh, do we have to do in terms of uh, meeting the power requirement, the 500 watts. So we have to design a wheel that meets the 500 watts. Now up here in the right-hand corner is the Hubble. You can see the, the solar rays up here. The Hubble is a battery dominated system. So everything is run off the batteries, just like uh, you know the cars and your cell phones and things like that. And the solar ray, all it does is charge. So we can only charge during the daylight, can't charge at night. And so therefore we uh, have to make sure we don't draw more out of the batteries than they can replenish with the solar rays. So we're allocated 500 extra watts 
to just to doing the maneuver, the quiescent power in the reaction mill is about 45 watts, which takes care of all the DC to DC conversions and telemetries and commands and so on. So now with 500 watts and two minutes, it takes to start the acceleration and stop it. You can work out that this turns out to be by, uh, con by uh, conservation of energy, uh, the, the 0.2 degrees per second. So if that's true, it's 0.22 degrees a second, and we've designed the inertia so that the ratio is a one to 100,000, then the reaction wheel speed has to be 100,000 times greater than this, okay? So we're now gonna make the reactions wheel speed 3,000 RPM, okay? That if this is in rotations per minute, if we take the 60 and divide it in, that'll give us rotations per second. And like we said before, cycles per second is a Hertz. And so that says we can go 50 Hertz. This rate here requires that the vehicle go to 22 Hertz for its maneuvering capability. Now we made it larger because it turns out that there are external torques on the vehicle. The, the uh, gravity grade is trying to straighten the wheel, the, uh, the vehicle out. So it points towards the earth. And so we have to fight that it's trying to overturn us into towards the earth. There's also error torques that are hitting the system and they come into cyclic terms as well as a steady state term. So the, the wheel now is sized to absorb all these cyclic terms and to hold a portion of the inertially fixed torque coming from the aerospace, from the aero density. The uh, magnetic torque system, which is on the vehicle, that is used to fight the, the external torques. It's basically the wheel in, in absorbing the torques will increase its wheel speed and the momentum, the magnetic control system, what it does is it uses the wheel speeds to drive the uh, wheel speeds to a lower value and it's leaning on the vehicle all the time. So the vehicle has to have enough torque to overcome the torque that's being pushed on it so that it can desaturate the wheel also. And so now we've got the different rates here. We go up here and look at the budget. We have four and a half milli arc seconds. So the, the gyro is used for angle as well as rate. It's an angle gyro, integrating gyro, which means its output is incremental angle. And so we're going to make the incremental angle about 1 20th of this, okay? So that says that we're gonna make it one quarter of a milli arc second, which in terms of micro degrees is like a 10th of a micro degree. So now we have the, the parameters set up for the gyroscope and maneuver mode we have to set the rate on the gyro. It's 0.22 degrees per second for maneuvering, but this is also the same gyro we use to capture the uh, in safe mode to get to the sun as fast as we can. And so we've upped this so we can have a little extra capability to, to get to the sun quick, because again, we're living on the batteries. And if you don't get to the sun, the batteries will deplete too much. And that would be uh, not a good situation for the system. And then the pulse weight, since this is a half a degree a second, that's 1800 degrees per hour. And this is third degrees an hour. The pulse weight goes up by a factor of 60. And this next chart then is, tells us what the structure of the PCS is. The, uh, the space telescope communicates through the high gain antenna to the, uh, the, the synchronous altitude trans uh, tracking and delay reader DNA, data relay satellite. It comes down through the me one megabit link to the antenna on the ground. And so the ground has two major components, which is the uh, science operations control system called Stock, which is run by Goddard. And they are basically managing the uh, vehicle. They are responsible for its health and welfare, as well as the science. The science people are pushing uh, to, the, uh, to the scientists to get in their uh, data into what they want to do for, for testing. And so they send in their proposals, and then they decide which ones they want to do. And so they're usually doing this one or two years ahead of time. So we need a system where we can provide the capability for people to pre-program all their activities into the system. So now in terms of the structure, the, the uplink commands coming up on the PCS is we break it into two parts. There's a time processor. So they send us up time-based commands. These are the commands that tell us when to turn a box on or when they want to do a maneuver. And then there's a conditional processor, which allows them to do decisions to decide which path they want to go to. It allows branching, it allows circling, it allows different kinds of operations. So the way that works is that the science instrument and the fine guidance centers have a, a success, no success flag that they pass to us, okay? So if we ask, for example, the, the fine guidance sensor to go out and find a guide star and it doesn't find it, it comes back with no success and then we go to the next guide star pair. Similarly, if the science instrument finds out that when we move them to where they want to be, 
it wasn't exactly where they wanted to be. They come back with no success. And then if they've programmed into it, we'll move to the next position that they would like us to go to. The capability of the scientists to work at real time is, is, exists. So there is a system of uh, the station in the Goddard uh, stock and as a thing at the Science Institute. So if they put a timed weight in the conditional processor, they can be running the vehicle real time. But as I mentioned before, nothing gets into the vehicle unless it goes to our command generator so we can shape the profiles of the system. So let's talk a little bit about a second about this. So this is the block diagram of the system, the control system, a generic biogram. So this is the spacecraft. This is the vehicle with the solar rays and the, uh, all the other structural modes. And then it, that is the sensor. So the sensor basically is the fine guidance sensor when we're locked on to the fine guidance sensor or we generate attitude with the gyro. So the gyro has the pulse weight. And so we can integrate pulse weights, add them up and that will tell us what the angle is. So we have a, this can provide both rate and angle during the maneuvers and other times that we need things like that. The actuator is the reaction wheels. The magnetic torques are only used for the magnetic control system, but it has similar kind of st structure to this. And so the actuator then uh, is driven by the con compensation in the system. So we have a pretty standard PID control, a proportional integral derivative. It has about 12th order worth of filters in it. It has uh, saturations and switching lines. The, the idea then is that it's an average uh, one minute's worth of data. We're getting data out of the fine guidance sensor at 40 hertz. That's the rep rate on, on the control system. So we're calculating every 25 milliseconds, sending a command out. And it puts in the error here. And any uh, system, basically, it, this is what the gyro measures. And so it, out of that, it figures out what's the bias error that it's not getting, because this figures out what the DC bias is on us for us as, as it changes versus time. Now, one thing is the a quarter of a milli arc second here would saturate the reaction wheel torquers. So therefore you cannot drive the system with the angle error. You have to have another path and that's the accelerator. Just like in your car, you wanna go faster. Well, you come through the accelerator and you tell it to give me this acceleration and it goes right into the reaction wheel. So the speed of response for the system is totally due to the acceleration. This is basically an error correcting loop that we have on the system. There's other, other modes changes that you can have in the system so you can change the gyro uh, gains and the like. Programmable commands. All right, so we have a programmable command structure that provides the ability to pre-program science operations. Uh, the constructs are the software language they have in the conditional process uh, stored. And so there's a whole group of them here, which are mainly for the scientists to use so they can used to, they'll tell us what branch operation, they can time the branch operation. The branch operation is if the instrument tells us they had a success or failure, that tells us which one of these paths to go down next to do the operation they want. If they want to somehow delay it for some reason, then they have the ability to do that also. There's some commands for the ground to initialize our pointer and, and get the vehicle time set and so on, coordinate with them. There, this one here, the one way word word memory load is used for the uh, the system to uh, change gains in the system or whatever needs to be done. There's a telemetry, a group of telemetry tables and they can pick which ones they would like. The fine guidance sensor has commands, which is mainly the logic so we can lock it up. And then there's the vehicle commands, which we've talked about before, so we can do maneuvers. So now looking over how that works. So the stored program command, which is on hard time, typically is used to turn on the, the units. So there's three fixed edge star trackers and the Star Trek is they picked one or two. There's a 31 command. So out of this list of constructs, we have a, an onboard interpreter. So when it sees a 31 command, it knows what you want to do. It looks into the fine guidance and says, okay, you want these two processed, I'll do it. And then it puts into the processing for the software. But even though it's processed the data, it doesn't get into the control system unless someone sets up a 45 command that tells us which sensor they want to use. So a lot of times the fixed edge trackers might be just used for an attitude update at the end of the uh, maneuver. And then the, what we do then is if it's an attitude update, we leak that in through the command generator to correct the attitude. The fine guidance sensor has, there's three of them. Two of them are used for the fine guide for controls. Uh, it's going to be two and three because they've dedicated the fine guidance sensor number one for astrometry, which is basically measuring the angle between stars and galaxies. And the, so two and three is our, is our choices for selection. So 
they can put a commit. They want two of them, or they just want one of them. If they want two, then we process two guidance sensors, uh, fine guidance sensors. The brightest guide store go is acquired first because that makes it the easiest one for to us to acquire because we have a, a brighter object in the sky. There's an X and a Y inside. We'll talk about that in the next other chart. But the, the V2, V3, each one of them generates their information relative to the tilt, the rotations from the V2, V3. And three. So once we know what FGS it is, we can rotate it in the proper frame and bring it into the, uh, the focal plane of the telescope. So the first thing it does, it goes into cost track and we'll talk about that in a future thing. If, they, if we don't hold it back, but here's the logic commands we have. They tell us all the logic, but they don't want to hold, if they want to let it go through, it just drops through autonomously, goes into fine mode acquisition. Now, once it's done all the logic and checked it, and we've checked it to make sure it meets the angle constraints between the guide stars, then that can be placed into the control system. There's the observer we kind of showed before and the other one. Uh, the controller has five gain sets for the, uh, the science mission so they can select which one they would like for the kind of operation they do. Uh, the momentum management system we mentioned was the magnetic torque is what the, the, the uh, takes in the speed of the system and, and desaturates the wheels. Uh, the high gain antenna has a broadband beam on it so we can just be open loop pointed by the ground They give us that. Similarly, the solar mover, they have their own shaping on their command so that they don't excite our uh, the solar array that they provided to us. All right, so now the reaction wheel and the gyro. The reaction wheel is the device that you see here. This is the, this is the housing of the reaction wheel that's bolted onto the frame of the, uh, of the spacecraft. This is 24 inches in diameter, 20 inches high. The inner rotor inside the thing is this clamshell looking rotor. The, the, the stator on the, on the motors and tachometers are are fixed to the housing. So when the housing gets bolted in, it fixes this. And now we have a motor that can turn inside there on these bearings and rotate the wheel. The wheel is uh, 19 and a half inches in diameter. I've, the, in red here, we've shown that's got the tip mass because that's where all the inertia is going to be pretty much put into the system. The imbalance in the rotor, because that is one of our concerns, is the imbalance in the rotor is going to excite, potentially excite the uh, st structural modes, but we've balanced them to four micro inches, so there is no such pot that it's not going to excite anything. So there's a lot of been work done on, on balancing the wheels. This is the, the one time spin speed, and this is the two time spin seed. And this is the uh, 2.8, which is the bearing retainer. Now here's the bearing. This, the retainer force is the uh, phenolic uh, thing inside the gyro, inside the bearing, I should say, that holds the balls in place. So you can see we're way down into the mud because these are just little phenolic uh, things. And then the bearing terms of these are due to the raceway defects. Again, it's just the raceway defects for these bearings, which are ground to be an ABEC 9, which is the best bearing you can get. And so therefore these are, are relatively benign numbers as far as I was concerned. The, the way that could brought the reaction wheel works, as we mentioned before, it's, it's not holding any one speed. This is holding one speed so they can get measurements for a test in the, the suppliers. But the, the reaction wheel is actually moving up and down and it probably doesn't get much above 10 Hertz during the science mode because that's the level that we're gonna get from absorbing the, uh, the uh, gravity gradient torques and the, uh, the acyclic torques that we get plus whatever residual we have of the inertial fixed torques. So we typically are in this region down here. And again, the, the telescope, the primary mirror is, is probably in this region here and the secondary mirror is in this region. So essentially they're at very high frequencies. So the only time we can ever get up there is when they do a maneuver and add 22 to this. So we'd be 22 would be the number for the maneuver and then it would go back another 10 or 14. So it could be in this, it'd be one time speed, spin speed. So it would move that up to a higher value. And the, again, it would be just be a real small number and it won't excite the uh, bearing, the uh, structural modes. So the rate integrating gyro. It, this gyro, as we mentioned, integrates means it puts out the integral of rate, which means that it puts integral angles out. Uh, we've mentioned before that the integral angle is going to be, it's, it, it's, it's resolution is one quarter of a milli arc second. 
Okay, so here's the box. This is the box that the astronaut comes up and replaces when he puts the gyros in, which we're going to hear about later. So the, the box has two precision drilled holes in the bottom, and the it may mag, mates to two uh, precision pins on the Perkinama section, the uh, optical bench. And then we, the astronaut can come up and replace it to, to arc seconds of accuracy. So what's in the gyro? So the gyro essentially has a, a, a mount that a mount in the box. When it's in the box, by the way, there is a, a heater. So the gyros are all kept at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's to stabilize the parameters in the gyro like the magnets and uh, the, the fluid that, that we're gonna talk about. So now here's that main, here's the main housing that, that contains the float assembly. And then it contains some torquers and the, uh, so this end is the signal generator. So the way the gyro is gonna work is it's gonna start to rotate. So here's the spin axis, here's the spinning axis. So the wheel rotates around, H is the notice angular momentum. So the, it rotates around, it's a ceramic uh, rotor. It runs on a ceramic path, it, it's pad. It's a, it's a uh, gas-filled gyro, 90% helium and uh, hydrogen rather than 10% helium. And it's going to uh, be lifted as soon as you turn the motor on and start spinning it, it lifts off there and it starts spinning around. Now the, the gas was coming out before uh, and causing turbulence. So we've put a shroud on it to get the noise in the gyro down. The reason we're getting the noise to the gyro is it's not that it affects the, the jitter or line of sight pointing or anything like that. What it does is it saturates the reaction wheel. When you have a really uh, small torquer in order to just put uh, minuscule forces or torques onto the uh, tubble, then it doesn't give much dynamic range for the, for the gyro noise to come out. So we have a fifth order filter on the gyro, plus we've knocked this down. So basically now the gyro doesn't have any uh, risk of coming out anywhere near saturating the, the reaction wheels. All right, so now we've got the angular momentum, we understand that. So the, the, the thing is, the float is constrained. It's, it's a magnetically suspended system. So it's constrained to only rotate around the, this axis, okay, which is called the, at spin at the output axis here. If you so, this is the spin axis. This is the axis it can rotate around. So this has to be then the input axis, spin in out. It puts the omega cross times this way, and the output axis is the axis we're going to torque around. So for the gyro, the output axis is our torque axis. We're going to put a torque on this to resist the rotation caused by the the rate vehicle, the input rate with the angular momentum. So now with this float can move, uh, a pulse is gonna be worth in this gyro, it's gonna be one eighth of a milli arc second. So what happens is you, the rate goes in and the gyro integrates that rate. And when it hits a signal here, that tells it it's up one eighth of a milli arc second, it comes down and gives it a torque to reset it to zero. So every time it starts to rotate up, it gets reset to zero. The clock inside here that's doing this, is 300,000 kilohertz uh, resetting the, on this thing. And the, this gives us a lot of precision. So we mentioned before the, the readout is, is twice of that. That's because of the way the readout electronics works, but the gyro never forgets anything. The gyro has all the information, even though we might've read it out with a factor of two on, on small signals, it's gonna say, you didn't take the right number out and it'll keep giving us the number back and eventually we'll, it'll average out to what it tells us to be averaged out to. I just put this thing, that's, this is typically, so the measured rate then is the torque over age, but the, the, uh, the, since we're getting incremental angles, we, we therefore know what, what's happening. Uh, here's the fine guidance sensor. The fine guidance sensor, let's talk about this path. So what we're looking for in the fine guidance sensor, here is the guidance star that it's looking for. But it, what it does is the way the wave front, we're up pointing off. So this is the bore side of the telescope and the the guide, the guide star is at an angle to it, okay? And so its wavefront is coming in at an angle. And so the whole idea of the fine guidance sensor then is to find out what angle it takes to make our bore sight perpendicular to the wavefront coming down from the guide star. So the, uh, the, the tilted rays are coming down in here. It goes into the pickoff mirror. So now let's jump towards this one now. So here's the fine guidance sensor as a physical piece of hardware. 
It's five and a half feet long. It's about three and a half feet wide. And the telescope rays are coming in here into the pickoff mirror. As we mentioned now, all the units, radial units, are sitting there with arms on them that have to reach down into the into photograph because it's taking a circular picture. That mirror then reflects it back up and it hits the aspheric collimating mirror, which is the pickoff mirror, goes up to the aspheric mirror. <clears throat> this is going to try and take the, uh, the telescope aspheric, uh, uh, spherical harmonics out, and it also collimates the line of sight, the, the rays. So they come down back through the star selector servo. So this is star selector A. I put a little V1 here because this then has to be optically aligned with the telescope, okay? That's what, even though it doesn't physically look like it's in that direction, it's optically aligned in this direction. So this is a very important alignment because this is the alignment then that determines how well we're gonna do. And it goes through this star selector servo. It's a 21 bit encoder. It's got, it's motor driven and it has a nine inch through hole and the, the motor is a 10 inch bearing on it. So the torquer that's on this motor is four times the torquer on the reaction wheel because they have to get this system up to about 200 Hertz in order to overcome the bearing friction. And then also in there, in the, each of the Risley prism, in, inside each star like the server, is a Risley prism, which offset the, the light rays into a 7.1 arc minute cone. So coming out of here, the light is coming along the V1 axis, but by the time it gets out of the star like the servo, it's on a cone that's got 7.1 minute arc, uh, 7, 7.1 arc minute radius. And so that's coming down into here. And this now sits on the cone that's coming out of the other one and it creates its own cone. And we'll talk about how this goes in a second here. The, uh, then it comes down to the star selector and it goes through the filter, the band, it goes to a beam splitter. The beam splitter takes half the energy, sends it this way, half the energy sends it that way. Now internal the coordinates to the uh, fine guidance sensor because they're fixed in the box. And then the box is calibrated relative to its mounting fixed point in the, in the vehicle on an optical bench. And then we know where they are. And so we can rotate the X and the Y back into V2 and V3, because what we're looking for is the tilt of the focal plane. And the focal plane is defined by V2 and V3. And the way it's kind of de defined is th that's what they're looking at. This, this light is coming in right off of the, the focal plane assembly. It's about the si focal plane uh, image. The, the image is about the size of a pie plate. So we are looking at the outer rim of pi. So it goes up here, it splits it, and now it goes into a, what's called a Kester prism. It's a split prism. And so light goes in and this just it obviously is flooding the, the face here, but it goes through and then the photons on this side will go out to the photomultiplier tube here. And then the photons coming through here go to this photomultiplier tube. Photomultiplier tube is such that when the, the uh, photon hits the surface, it's got a semiconductor surface on it. It kicks off a photoelectron. There's about, 2000 volts across the photomultiplier tube. So it accelerates that down and hits the, the base and the base then turns it into an electron that goes in to drive the electric circuit that counts, that counts the photons. So both of these are photon counting systems. Both of them have a, a five by five arc second square field stop. So all that the, the photomultiplier tube can see is a five by five arc second square on the sky. So now with, this is an interferometer. So with the, the wave or the calculation for the interferometer is the A pulses minus the B pulses over the sum of the pulses. And that's what's called the S curve. Now let's look what the S curve looks like. So this is the signal in the S curve. And you can see that the linear range of the interferometer is plus or minus 20 milli arc seconds. In other words, this is the tightest thing that we have to meet, even though the, the pixel in the wide field planet camera is, is 40 milli arc seconds. There's nothing as tight as this. And this is the one that we have to make sure that they and I and the PCS are in sync here. So we do guide them. We give them a command signal to move them so they don't have to move themselves. They have a control system that's about three times, four times faster than ours. And the, but it's not that, it's not fast enough to keep out of the trouble. And so they have to keep it really in here. Uh, so we have to hold them tight. Now, this is the S curve. Ideally, the, the magnitude of the S curve should be 0.7, uh, but it's not quite there, but you can see they're getting a fairly good curve. 
And so this is not angle. So to get angle, Perkinoma gives us a fifth order polynomial with calibrated coefficients they picked up in testing. And then that allows us to turn this signal into the interferometer uh, output. So the signal coming out of the star selector, the, star, the fine guidance sensor is the star selected servo angles and it's the interferometer signal. So from that, we can figure out where they are in, in, the, in the plane and, and get the errors from them. So now how did, how did the FGS acquire stars? Well, as he mentioned before, there's optical arms due to this, these, the, uh, these star selectors. And they, at the end of them, they have five by five arc second fields of view. Now it's kind of an exaggeration because this is really uh, about 10.2 arc minutes and this is about 13.8. Uh, and this is 250 arc seconds across, a little better than uh, three arc minutes. So this is a very small aperture compared to the overall size of, of the Perkinoma fine uh, field of view. This is often called the pickle because of its shape. And so what the ground does is the catalog, the star they want to go after, the catalog tells them where the star is until just about one arc second. And then we're going to have an error due to the maneuver, due to the, the uh, drift in the gyro and the star select the servo, uh, the, uh, the, the gas factor and so on, so that we have to have some play in here so we can place them. And then they are able to scan out. So we they initially start here, even though I show the field here, but they keep it distinct, I pull them up. So it starts up here where it thinks it is, and then it's gonna go in a scan, and it does that, and how does it know it's where it actually is? Well, it takes the sum count out of all the fault and multiply it to us, because if you take A plus B out of both of them and add them up, then that is actually the magnitude of the light that's coming through. And so that gives them the magnitude measurement they need. And so if it meets the magnitude that's loaded into the uplinked, uh, command load that people gave us in the conditional processor, then they, they say, I've got it. And so they say, I got the star. And then they immediately go and go around the star. Now, again, it's only five by five arc seconds. And what they're trying to do is create an equal light path at each corner of the square. And when they think they have the light path equal, then they know that's the, in quotes, the centroid of the five by five arc second square. But they still haven't a captured fine lock, but they want to, uh, to find mode to get that fine pointing to on the interferometer. But that captures the centroid. And then if we don't, if the ground doesn't tell us to stop them from moving down, they will autonomously go into uh, trying to acquire the, the interferometers. Now, this interferometer signal extends across the whole five by five arc second. So there's an X and a Y that extends across the whole region, but it's only 20 milli arc seconds wide. So they have to find that 20 milli arc seconds. So they step back because there may be alignment errors and they have to diagonal moving six arc, six milli arc seconds per step. And so this is 20 milli arc seconds plus or minus. So they look for three counts that look like it would be something that looks like this shape curve, okay? So as they're coming in, they would see one count, two counts, three counts, and they would, they would say, okay, this looks like the interferometer. When they do that, they capture to this interferometer. That's their plan. So the fine guidance sensor then directs them to null out the interferometer. And so the fine guidance sensor is their nulling instrument to push them into the center of the system. Now, once they acquire one fine guidance sensor, uh, one, one interferometer, they're up, by, up high. They haven't found the other one yet. So then they just kind of walk down that interferometer signal until they hit the next interferometer signal. When they hit another one, they capture to that. When they've got both of them captured with the star selected servo, they send a command to us that they have captured it. And then they, they go on to guide star two that we store. We give them that. So in the next fine, in the text field of view, there's another uh, star fine guidance sensor next to it. And so it goes into the same process. It has two guides or has a guide star, maybe a backup guide star. And the system is, is going, to, going to acquire it. When they acquire a star and, and the, this one acquires a star, they tell us we've got both of them. The commands come back to the software. The software looks in the command list and sees what should the angle be between those two, two stars. And if the angle is incorrect, it rejects it. In the conditional process, it says failure. It says no success. And therefore, they'll go on to the next guide star pair if someone's programmed that into a branch statement. But if it 
If it meets the angle of criteria, then they drop into the, the fine pointing mode. Like they tell us we're ready now to, to give you information. And we start using these fine guidance sensor and process it for the data. So now how well does the system do? Well, here's the ultraviolet coverage of the Hubble ultra deep field in 2014. Now this edge, this is there's been a lot, a lot of uh, field using somewhat similar data and just compiling it as time goes on. But the new part of this one is it's doing the ultraviolet. So one of the advantages of Hubble is it has a ability to capture uh, ultraviolet levels as well as going down into the infrared. Now the Webb telescope, which is in process now, th this has, it's an infrared telescope. So the hope everyone has is that Hubble will keep going so that it can make dual images, one with the Hubble, which will get them up into the higher region, uh, the ultraviolet region, and then the, they can complementary in, instruments. So here's the field of view. The field of view of the wide field planetary camera is 160 arc seconds square. To put this in perspective, it would take 24 million of these pictures, 1,000 square degrees, and this is about 2,000th of a square degree. And so it takes quite a bit of uh, these pictures. So Hubble is basically a surgical instrument that goes up and sees an area of the sky that the Scientists all agree is a very important uh, information so they can either test their theories or come up with new ideas or whatever. And so this is the uh, picture we take. Now we're holding it to seven milli arc seconds. So we're holding it to seven thousandths of an arc second, which is like one sixth of a pixel in the wide field planetary camera. And then we do overlay images from orbit to orbit. We overlay that to within 10 milli arc seconds, which is a quarter of the, uh, the, the width of the pulse in, in a wide field planet camera. So wh when you see these dots of light, we're holding the lights on a pixel pretty well. And so this then gives them the opportunity to get the, uh, uh, the, the brightness they need. And the same thing for the spectrographs, we're holding them very accurately. So they're getting the information they need to know about the spectral composition of the, of the stars. So this, this provides the uh, information for drawing these kind of uh, ult, you know, ultimate uh, ultra field things. So this, this shows a 1.3 billion light years uh, within a few millions of years of the Big Bang. Uh, it's a constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. This is 841 orbits of Hubble. It's also augmented by some of the, the data from the infrared experiments and the close-in mapping satellites. Uh, it's 10,000 galaxies in it. As you mentioned, Hubble's UV capability filled in the period from five to 10 billion light years when most of the stars were born in the universe. And the way that the Hubble gets the good UV capability is in the coatings that are on the primary mirrors. So the primary mirror has three millionths of an inch of aluminum, but if it was only aluminum, UV would get absorbed by the aluminum. So they cover it with a millionth of an inch of, of a magnesium fluoride and then that ups the UV capability is 75% transmission, and it only degrades the aluminum down to about 85%. So now they're getting a good throughput for both UV and the, uh, the optical regions that they are uh, looking at it lower uh, what, if, towards the IR. I said, how'd they do that? Just kind of a little repeat of what we talked about before is do the flexible commands constructs that allow them to, to do repeatable orbits. And during the initial observation, if they know that that's the star field they want to come back to, like for example, they would they have been visited this one many times, and they say, "I would like to go back to the same star field." So they they put in the command load that they would like to come back. The st FGS star select the servo settings are saved by us autonomously, and then the software settings that we use, we do velocity aberration calibrations, we do lots of corrections to the system as well as our own inertial inf information. So that allows them to come back for future observation. And as we said before, we would place them back within 10 milli arc seconds. So now in summary, the PCS design met all the requirements. Uh, the flexible control system and the command structure lets the, uh, then the pre-program commit both the science institute and the ground station operations for as long ahead of time as they want. Uh, that, we, that way they have everything in a can ready to go as time goes on. And again, the stock decides whether the vehicle is operational and whether it should get the commands. And it's a joint uh, science institute 
stock decisions to make. All right, now, post-launch, the control system provided the attenuation of the solar array torque disturbances. The reason that there were torque disturbances is, is on the side of the solar arrays, there, were, uh, there are booms that extended. And these booms were not thermally coated. Uh, they didn't have any covers on them. So the, the, the situation was that when they came out from behind, they darkened to the light area. The, the sun hit one boom more fast, you know, faster and longer than the other one. And that allowed them the booms to distort unevenly. And when they did that, they got a, a torsion and there was a spring mechanism up here that had a lot of stiction and friction. And so in the process, then they, they weren't allowed, to, they weren't able to uh, uh, get the torque down. So we had to design something that would, would reduce the torque. So uh, just roughly 75% uh, of the, 95% uh, of the orbit was, was not usable and only 5% was. And when we put the fix in, which was to put in basically uh, a six, two six order filters, one that would wrap the, a loop around the, uh, the, the torque source itself, the, the vehicle that had the uh, no motion on it. And then the other six order filter essentially canceled it out. So the, the, the existing system didn't know it was there. So when we pulled it out, it, it, it didn't uh, change anything for the people who were designing, it was pretty transparent. And therefore when we put the filter in, it gave them about 95% of the uh, capability of the science back and they lost only maybe 5%. So post-launch, they also, we did the backup gyro, we, we being the stock, and I, I supported them on that. Uh, the design using a throw one gyro, two gyro system. The, uh, the system, the one gyro and two gyro system uh, can't do science, but it can do maneuvering. And so that's the idea. The, the, the gyros maneuver with the help of, of the magnetic field. So we they have a magnetometer, we carry a, a nine dipole model of the field on board. And so they can tell what the angle error is and they can use that then to put it into our control system uh, to drive the loops, okay? And so it doesn't actually have a rate signal but we could put a lead network on it and turn it into a rate signal. And then post-launch, they also replaced the uh, TF224 computer with a, an Intel 486 uh, 32-bit computer. So now I'm gonna introduce Cliff, who is going to talk about integration and test and launch. Thanks, Hugh. Hugh, the pointing control system certainly allowed the astronomers to make some amazing observations. I started on the Hubble program in October of 1977, the day that Lockheed was awarded the contract. My first assignment was in doing systems test planning. I then went to systems engineering where I was responsible for a department that wrote the crew system design requirements and the systems test requirements. I was then manager of an organization that audited the test plans of all of the hardware. In 1983, I became manager of the Hubble assembly and test. I went to the K I went to KSC with Hubble. I was on the pad when the shuttle bay doors were closed three days prior to launch. I'm now going to start talking about assembly test and launch of Hubble. Next. Hubble, the MILSPEC 1540 establishes the requirements for environmental and structural ground testing for launch vehicles, upper stage vehicles, space vehicles, and their subsystems and units. Lockheed and Sunnyvale had all the facilities required to perform the testing of shuttle size space vehicles that were required by this spec. Prior to the assembly, all Hubble boxes, mechanisms, and subsystems were tested as required by MILSPEC 1540. Hubby, Hubble was assembled and all ambient functional tests were performed in a class 10,000 clean room. Environmental test facilities that were used were acoustic, thermal vacuum, thermal balance, and EMC tests. The assembly of the Hubble equipment section started in early 1983. In the summer of 83, functional testing of the equipment section started. The telescope and fine guidance sensors were installed in late 1983 and in early 1984. Perkin Elmer equipment section started as soon as the equipment was installed. The scientific instruments were installed and tested as they became available from Goddard Space Flight Center. This is an image of the primary mirror prior to installation of the in the telescope structure at Perkinover. 
The mirror is 2.7 meters in diameter. You can see the reflection of the technician in the mirror that shows the 2.5 magnification of the mirror. The mirror is mounted to the main ring, three attach points on the main ring. Uh, assemble, allow the assembly of the mirror to the structure. The cover over the mirror opening prevents contamination of the mirror honeycomb, honeycomb structure. This shows the uh, Hubble in the high, high bay, uh, in, in the acoustic cell that was in a high bay across the a building from where the clean room was. You can see on the bottom of it, there's a work stand that it's standing on and it doesn't have wheels on it. It has pad, air pads that are, uh, air is pumped through them and when you're ready to move the vehicle and it's able to move very smoothly and, and quietly. This shows an image of an astronaut getting ready to perform a neutral buoyancy test at the, at the Marshall Space Flight Center. They perform neutral buoyancy tests at both Marshall and Johnson Space Centers. Um, and they did this by uh, putting the suited astronaut in the tank with weights on his legs. You can see those red tapes around there and weight around his waist so that he was neutrally buoyant. He was then lowered into the tank and started a simulated operation. What they did next, I make it back up. I'm sorry. The next, then they um, uh, would use they would use mock-ups of parts of the telescope and of some equipment that they wanted to demonstrate being replaced. One of the demonstrations that they did was they should install the the wide field planetary camera simulator. I'm missing some charts somehow. This is the Hubble getting ready to go to the Cape. Um, it's on a work stand, it's getting lowered down and it's going to be shipped to the Cape. It will go out into the high bay and then it will be shipped. This is Hubble launch. Next. This shows the astronauts performing some in-orbit maintenance after launch. And you, when they did this, they would retrieve the vehicle. Prior to retrieving it, they would close the aperture door to prevent any contamination from the uh, environment of the shuttle. And they would land, put it on the work platform and then they would have to keep it powered on in all cases because it, the, uh, all the instruments and all of the uh, boxes needed to be kept warm. Next, please. There is no next one. Okay. So it's... I will give you a summary. The conclusion is that Hubble was successfully tested. We demonstrated that we could perform in orbit maintenance by neutral buoyancy and access by the astronauts. And we met all of the requirements. That's my con the conclusion. I'll turn it over to Jim Carlock now. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, Cliff and his team successfully tested, assembled and tested the uh, Hubble. Uh, it was shipped to uh, Kennedy on uh, courtesy of the Air Force uh, on C-5A. Uh, they reassembled it uh, back at Kennedy in another clean room, redid the test to verify that nothing happened along the way, and uh, uh, then, then installed in the shuttle bay and uh, launch happened. Uh, once the shuttle clears the launch tower, then the Johnson Space Center takes over the shuttle operations. When it gets, when the shuttle gets on orbit, they uh, open the cargo bay doors, use the robotic arm and lift Hubble out of the cargo bay. And the, before handing it over to Goddard for, for operation and letting the shuttle go home, we wanted to make sure that we established communication and make sure that the solar arrays are out because we've got to keep the battery charged. The two most important things for any spacecraft is to uh, keep the batteries charged and communicate. Uh, the communication went well. Uh, one of the solar arrays went out just fine. The other solar array uh, deployed about halfway and uh, everybody had to get their heads together to decide what to do. And the universal decision was, let's try again. And we were lucky the second time it went all the way out. 
So now, now we're ready to start operations. The uh, Hubble could go home. I'm sorry, the shuttle could go home. Uh, since Hubble is, is in low Earth orbit, uh, it can't see the ground system all the time because it's going around the Earth and the ground station is fixed, of course. So the main communication path is from Hubble up through tracking and data satellite synchronous altitude. Uh, this TDRSS can see its ground station at White Sands, New Mexico all the time. And then there's a hard link from the ground station there to Goddard. So that's the primary communication path. Uh, Hubble also has tape recorders on board for times when uh, the communication path is broken and you need to record the science data. The first uh, few months of this and most other spacecrafts dedicated to check out the ground system and the ground to flight interface and all the flight uh, uh, hardware and software. Uh, during the checkout, we had two minor problems with the locking portion. Uh, one was we had a uh, limit set too tightly in the flight software. So that was a, just one database change in the flight software so that when we opened the aperture door, it didn't, uh, didn't trigger a, uh, a problem uh, and no impact on the operations. Uh, the second one was a little bit more subtle to troubleshoot uh, when they were doing through putting Hubble through its paces, the, uh, one of the gimbals on one of the antennas indicated an overcurrent and shut down. Uh, took a little while with the guys in Sunnyvale to get out the as-built photos and their CAD models and figured out we were a little too generous on specifying how, uh, how far the gimbals could travel. So uh, once we found out that was, it was a matter of a small change in the ground software that limited uh, the gimbal travel. Again, no real impact on the operations. Uh, as Hugh talked, uh, during the checkout of the pointing control system, everything was working fine, but we did notice some anomalous disturbances. Uh, after looking at uh, the nature of the disturbance and the, and the uh, frequency of the disturbance, that was traced back to the solar array reaction to solar heating. And as Hugh said, uh, they were able to modify the flight software to minimize this. It, they couldn't, couldn't make it go away until the uh, a solar array was replaced on the first servicing mission. The, uh, so it was a pretty, pretty clean checkout so far. The, uh, once, once the basic spacecraft was checked out, then it was turned over to the science teams to start checking the science instruments and the, uh, and the telescope. And that's when the uh, primary mirror problem surfaced that got all the publicity. But as discovered actually during the checkout of one of the science instruments, they couldn't, they found out they couldn't focus to the degree planned on. Uh, then there's a lot of work with the science team and the Perkin Elmer Corporation and the NASA team trying to figure out what had caused that and how big is the error. Uh, they traced it back to a very subtle error in the test equipment they used to grind the mirror. The mirror was a little bit too flat by a fraction of a human hair out at the edge of the uh, edge of the mirror. Once they found out what had caused the problem and how big it was, then they could design corrective optics to take up and install on the first servicing mission. So even though the first servicing mission corrected a lot of things, there was still a lot of significant science that could be done uh, prior to that. If you look on the Space Telescope uh, Science Institute page, you'll see quite a number of papers were written during this time using Hubble data. In summary, this development program here in Sunnyvale was a very successful program. I uh, certainly want to thank all the people who were part of this Hubble program. You, you made it possible. Uh, the uh, one, one key is not only did it work well, but our customers were happy. Uh, the last period and, is, and also a separate score on the overall contract performance, both were 100% awarded to us by the Marshall uh, program who was, who was in charge of our contract worked with folks to get a follow-on track to provide some operations support to Goddard and some engineering support to the maintenance mission. Uh, a third uh, piece of the customer uh, crowd would certainly be the scientists who uh, the reason for orbiting this telescope. The scientists originally planned on getting about 15 years out of the telescope. It's been up there about 31 years now. So 
a very successful program all around. Of course, the program itself is continuing. Just our uh, piece in Sunnyvale ended in uh, 1990. So with that, I'll bring uh, Cliff Gardner back. He'll talk about uh, what happened afterwards uh, with the servicing missions and a little bit of the uh, science that came from the Hubble. But again, I would refer you to the Science Institute uh, for that. So Cliff. Thanks, Jim. It really was an interesting program that we were fortunate to work on. I'm going to talk about the shuttle servicing mission and some of the observations made, as Jim said. Prior to launch, spares were built and tested to be used for in-orbit servicing. There were approximately 125 units that can be replaced in orbit. No units were redesigned to be repaired in orbit. Jim showed you a cartoon breakout of sort of how those boxes could be uh, installed and removed. Orbit replaceable units were designed to operate inspect for two and a half years in orbit with a probability of three sigma. Maintenance operations were designed so that it would require a one five eighths inch socket wrench to do all of the maintenance operations. However, NASA built over the years several hundred tools with five eighths inch sockets to simplify maintenance operations. This again shows the uh, astronaut, as I showed you in the earlier chart, the astronaut doing in orbit maintenance on the first maintenance mission. The first servicing mission was launched on December 1993, three years, seven months after launch. Five spacewalks were required. The operations they did was they removed the wide field planetary camera and installed the wide field planetary camera too. Wide field planetary camera was considered the primary instrument of the five in the observatory. The high speed photometer, which had completed 95% of its science and was virtually unaffected by the anomaly on the mirror was removed. And the corrective optic space telescope or axial replacement was installed. They called that the COSTAR. And it had, the COSTAR had five pairs of mirrors that could be moved into and out of the focal plane for the faint object camera, the faint object spectrograph, and the high speed uh, spectrograph. Two rate sensors were changed out, two magnetometers were changed out, two gyro electronic control units were changed out, and the astronauts installed the Goddard High Resolution Redundancy Kit and installed a coprocessor for the DF-224. The second servicing mission was launched on Shuttle Discovery in February of 1997, six years and nine months after launch. Five spacewalks were required. The high speed, the faint object spectrogram was replaced by the shuttle space, the space telescope imaging spectrograph. The high speed photometer was replaced by the infrared camera and multi object spectrograph. One of the fine guidance sensors was changed out with an upgraded fine guidance sensor. Optical control electronics enhancement kit was installed. One of the science engineering science tape recorders was removed and installed a, they installed a new solid state recorder. One of the other science engineering science tape recorders that was not performing correctly was replaced by a spare uh, engineering tape recorder. One of the reaction wheels was assembly was replaced. The data interface unit two was replaced and they removed the uh, solar arrays that they had. Um, one, they, one, they removed one of the solar array drive electronics and replaced it. This uh, third servicing mission was launched on shuttle discovery in December of 1999, nine years, seven months after launch three spacewalks were required. Note that I said December of 99, 1999. It was in late December that it was launched. The fine guidance sensor was replaced by a refurbished fine guidance sensor. This was when Hugh talked about where they removed the DF-224 computer and installed the Intel 486. They also installed a, a replaced a digital report uh, tape recorder data recorder with a solid state recorder. And one of the 
S-band transmitters was replaced and they installed a six voltage temperature improvement kits. And they also replaced one of the rate sensors. They had a couple optional uh, servicing mission, uh, operations that they wanted to perform. However, those were specified as optional because they wanted to return the shuttle to ground prior to the end of the year so they avoided any concern over the YK2 issues. Fourth servicing mission was launched on Shuttle Atlantis on March, in March of, 19, of 2002, 11 years and 11 months after launch. Five spacewalks were required. The European Space Agency uh, fine op, fine object camera was replaced by European Space Agency advanced camera for surveys. They removed the solar rays that they had installed and it's replaced them with rigid solar arrays that were a state of the art. These arrays were uh, smaller, but they could generate 20 to 30% more power. The power control unit was replaced. It was an updated power control unit that would be able to take advantage of the increased power. They installed a near infrared camera and multi op spectrograph cooler on one of the, on the infrared camera. They replaced one of the diode boxes and they replaced one of the reaction wheels. Next, please. The fifth service, fifth and last servicing mission was launched on Shuttle Atlantis in May of 2009, 19 years and one month after launch. Five spacewalks were required. The wide field planetary camera two was removed and replaced with wide field planetary camera number three. The uh, CoStar was removed, it was no longer needed, and they installed the cosmic origin spectrograph. And then these astronauts did some amazing things. They repaired two of the scientific instruments in orbit. As I mentioned earlier, that it was not designed to do that. And they had in their gloved hands, they had to remove the covers on the scientific instruments, do some rewiring and a replacement of some of the electronics in them. When they powered them back up, they found that they were operating amazingly well. Six rate sensing units were replaced. One of the fine guidance sensors was replaced. And the six nickel cadmium batteries that had been operating for 19 years, kind of like the energy bunnies, were replaced with six new nickel cadmium batteries. The scientific control, scientific instrument control and data handling unit was replaced with an upgraded scientific control and, hand, and handling unit. They also installed a soft capture mechanism on the exterior of the telescope in order that in the future, someday if they wanted to retrieve the cup Hubble, they could use that to attach to it. This shows an image of the astronauts uh, doing a, getting ready to do an in-orbit maintenance on the aft section. You can see there on the a remote manipulating system of the shuttle. This is an astronaut installing the wide field planetary camera. It's pretty amazing. It's a heavy object and there he is installing it by himself with some guidance from another astronaut. Now I'm going to talk about 30 years of discovery. Significant observations that were made by Hubble during science. I'm going to give you some examples. They obtained data on the expansion rate of the universe, which was really an amazing uh, feat and something that they were really interested in being able to do. They investigated, made a lot of investigations of our solar system. They observed how stars form, live, and die. They observed intricate shapes, structures, and histories of galaxies. They discovered massive black holes and found that black holes were everywhere in space. This image is, is called the third Hubble Hubble's 30th anniversary Im image. And every year, the Science Institute would select an image that they thought was of significant interest to the public and, and issued that as their anniversary image. This is called the, this observation shows a giant red nebula and a smaller blue nebula that are part of a star forming region in a galaxy satellite of the Milky Way. The nebula are 163 million light years away. This is an observation that's called Mystic Mountain. 
It shows the activity at the top of the pillar of gas and dust. The pillar is three light years tall. It's being seen, seen eaten away by the brilliant light from nearby stars. Infant stars inside the pillar fire off jets of gas that can be seen streaming from the towering peak. Some additional observations, discoveries that they made, they got a lot of additional information on as yet unexplained ph phenomena called dark energy. They're also using land-based uh, observatories to gather that information. They have made an observation of a dull star that suddenly became 600,000 times more luminous than our star. The star has since faded. They were able to gather significant new information about our moon's, moon's crust. They, and they made that one million second observation of a past sky, one-tenth diameter of the moon. That's the image that Hugh was talking about. This image is called the butterfly emerges from stellar demise. The observation is of a planetary nebula. What appears to be butterfly wings are heated gas to, um, to nearly 20,000 degrees Celsius. The gas is tearing across space at about 950,000 kilometers per hour. In the center of the dying star, once about in the center is a dying star, once a, about five times brighter than the, our sun. The star is ejecting gases and is unleashing a stream of ultraviolet radiation that is making the cast off materials glow. This image is 100, 380 light years away in the Milky Way. Next, please. This image is called the lightsaber. It's really an interesting image. The lightsaber appears to slice through the dark clouds of dust and gas that have surrounded it. The two beams of saber appearing light shooting out from the star at supersonic speeds are formed by material falling out of the newborn star. Sometimes clouds of dust or clouds of dust always create new stars as they fall inward. In this case, the materials streaming in erupted into fiery jets. Additional information that was gathered was detailed data on the expansion rate of the universe. They created an album of galaxies to observe their evolution. They observed planets on other stars and were able to actually analyze the environment of those planets. They observed planets forming in dust disks around stars. They observed galactic details and mergers. Next, please. This image is called a rose of galaxies. The shape of the larger of the two galaxies shows signs of tidal interaction with the smaller one. Astronomers believe that at some time the smaller galaxy passed through the larger one. The little jewels, blue jewels at the top are the combined light of clusters of intensely light, bright and bright and hot and young stars. Next, please. This image is called the antenna galaxy unloaded. The observation is of two galaxies locked in a deadly embrace. They were once normal, sedate, spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. The pair have spent the last several hundred million years clashing with one another. The clash is so violent, the stars have ripped from their host galaxies to form an stream of arc between the two. The far-flung st stars and streamers of gas stretch out into space, creating long tidal waves reminiscent of antennae. There are clouds of, blue and, of pink and red gas around the blue flashes that are forming new stars. Eventually, these two nuclei will, re will merge and become one. In summary, one Hubble contract requirement was to operate for 15 years with a servicing mission every two and a half years. Hubble continues to operate 31, and a half, 31 years after launch with only five maintenance missions. The last one was performed 11 years ago. Hubble is expected to remain operational in a, as gradually in a reduced state for another nine years. After another Hubble contract requirement was to be to detect images two billion light years away. Hubble has made observations of images more than 13 billion light years away. Hubble made a, the 11 day observation of a patch of sky one tenth the diameter of the moon. All Hubble servicing mission operations were successfully performed. The Space Telescope Science Institute has made 
over 30 years of observations. One day of observations fills the equivalent of an encyclopedia. So it's time for the panel's discussion. If everybody appropriately turns on their cameras. We have a bunch of open questions here. Um, Cliff, uh, Kay, are you going to ask, ask, read them, or am I going to read them? Well, I, I can read some, and then you can take over. Um, let's see where we start. Let me, let me uh, start with one I was in the middle of answering on online. Uh, there's a double question. What work could I learn more about the mission? And I said the NASA Goddard site and the Space Telescope Science Institute site. And the person also said, how can I reach your group? Uh, Tom, do you have a, a, an answer for that one? Yes, I gave the uh, URL www.siliconvalleyhistory.org. Okay. Or if you just look, you know, Google IEEE Silicon Valley History Technology Committee, you'll get all sorts of links. The answer. So, so Tom. Yeah, Cliff. You know, I'll just go down uh, the questions that were answered, but perhaps were delayed till now. And there were a few of them. Uh, and I'm going to start at the top unless you uh, have another activity. I think you starting at the top it would be work fine. Okay. Uh, one question, anonymous attendee, has the Hubble ever faced problems in space? And I'm not sure what the intent of that question is, but maybe the panel can... Uh, uh, jump in. Problems in space. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, to start with, there were the minor problems we had during checkout. And of course, during, during the course of Hubble, uh, in between servicing missions, there were failures of hardware. And uh, as Dr. Doherty uh, talked about, uh, for example, when, more th when fewer than three gyros were available, uh, they came up with a system to be able to operate with fewer than three. Now, you don't get full capability until you get the next servicing uh, mission up. So yes, there were problems. There were none that I'm aware of that were catastrophic in the sense that they were worried about losing the uh, spacecraft. Uh, Hugh, you may have some more insight into that. No, I think, Jim, that you said the, the thing no one's looking for problems and no one found problems. So, I mean, anything was that there was a problem showed up and people took care of it, so. Well, let me ju jump to one of the other questions. Uh, I think it's for you, was the gyro design unique for the Hubble or is it based on a previous design? Well, it, it was a platform gyro uh, that was used by MIT on the guidance systems, actually Polaris. And uh, there, there was a torquer put on it to make it a strap down gyro. This gyro has been around a long time. Goddard used it on some of their space missions, uh, you know, and we, you know, adapted it for our use. Uh, so anyway, it, it's been around a long time as a gyro. It, the uh, operations have been well documented by other people like, God, like the Goddard efforts. I think, I, I think the, uh, you could almost trace it back to V2 rockets if you tried hard enough. Um, okay, this is a good question here because um, I don't know the answer and it's, uh, it's curious. What is the orientation of the four reaction wheels? Are they oriented like the four sides of a tetrahedron? Well, they're, they're oriented like the ribs on an umbrella so that they put 30% of their torque and uh, momentum into the V1 axis and the other 70% into the V2, V3 uh, focal plane of the system. They're not a tetrahedron. Yeah, well, good question though. Okay, um, there was a question about KH11s. You know, that's not something that uh, uh, anybody wants to discuss. I think we got to move past that kind of thing. Um, how much longer can Hubble remain uh, operational? Well, if you, if you listen to the, there, there was a, there was the thing you sent me, which was the, 
infant, the ticket video put together by the stock ground station, and they said they're confident they can make it to the 1930s. Yeah. So I mean, I, I don't think the ground station sees a problem, and they're closer than any of us, you know. I think you mean 2030s. I have another 2030. Question. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> another question just came in on the same subject. Could a future maintenance mission extend the Hubble life even further? Is one possible? If so, when? Well, the maintenance missions were all predicated originally on using the shuttle. And of course, there is no more shuttle. So uh, could they do a maintenance mission with a robotic uh, uh, mission? Not, not very likely. They'd need another manned mission. So I, I, we'd be speculating on that. I would suspect the answer is no. Uh, anybody else got a, got a comment there? I agree. Well, I'd say nobody's nobody's building hardware, so there's nothing to bring up. So unless they start a contract to start an effort on the ground, uh, not doesn't make difference to have anyone else to go up. Uh, here's a question that Tom Gardner answered. Uh, I'm not sure of the answer, so I'll ask you, Hugh. Uh, what is a PID? <laughs> Proportional integral derivative. Ah, it's a okay. proportional gain plus an integral gain plus a derivative gain. It's a, it's a control system question that I certainly should know the answer to, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, my, right. It took my class. Yes, <laughs> I did. I knew I knew it was I knew that was what the, the you know the nature of the answer should be, but I didn't have it at my fingertips. Um boom. Let's see. We got some more open questions. Uh, vibrations and liftoff. Well, okay. If you want to answer that, anybody? Well, uh, what about vibration what? and liftoff? Yeah. During liftoff, uh, you, there are some vibrations. Now, the Hubble was tested in an acoustic chamber where they blasted it with much higher vibration levels, sound levels than it uh, had on the ascent. And on ascent, the uh, Hubble is not live as far as controlling anything. It's, it's, uh, basically uh, just a payload. In fact, the only, the only thing we had, uh, once they closed the shuttle bay doors, the only observation we could see was what was the temperature in the, uh, in the cargo bay. But it, it had seen, as, as a matter of test, much higher vibration levels than uh, experienced in, in ascent. I mean, also the black boxes all have to go through a qualification test where it puts them on a shaker table and they have to get uh, you know, excited that way. So they get a lot of a shaking the rattle and roll before they go. The, uh, it was the, uh, in the acoustic test, it was subjected to 135 dB for two minutes. Here's one here. Uh, what aspects of Hubble are the most outdated with respect to current technology? I, I would say it's the computer technology because in 2004, the scientists wished they had a new computer up there, but that's typical of all the missions because even the Voyagers have old computers and the scientists are complaining about that. But their comment was it's better to have something to work with it that they can use, you know, we can't update everybody's technology. I would say the gyros and the reaction wheels and all the other pieces of the hardware are pretty current state of the art. There's no one's got something as good as them. Here's one that I think I can answer. Does anyone have the capability of mounting a service mission to the Hubble? And the answer is Elon Musk amongst others. The question is, does he want to? Well, someone got to pay him. So I'm going to fund it. I, God is big on, re, on uh, using automata, you know, and not using people. So, you know, if they could do some kind of an automata mission where they sent a robot up, uh, that would be more the direction that they would be willing to fund. Uh, there was some question here, uh, and it was asked twice about uh, the shipping of Hubble to the Cape. Uh, from Lockheed in Sunnyvale. Uh, what I see here, somebody has written is that there was a, a barge channel behind Moffat deepened for a seagoing barge. Has anybody ever heard of, of that? And then uh, with the Challenger disaster, 
uh, somehow a C5 became available and ready to ship Hubble. Any clarification? Well, originally the barge shipping to the Port of Oakland and picked up by a ship that down through the Panama Canal was the original plan. But by the time it got around, uh, the Air Force had developed a uh, generic uh, shipping container uh, that would fit on a C-5 to ship from any place to either Vandenberg or uh, to Kennedy. Uh, that was done back when uh, there was the thought that uh, all future large payloads would be shuttle compatible and uh, they would stop using expendable launch vehicles. So that was available then. That wasn't available when the contract started. Here's one, what are the main failure mechanisms of the gyro? Bearings, hydrogen helium leak, do they even have hydrogen helium? Anything else? Yeah. Well, when the, the thing that's failed, uh, and I hate to say failed, but the thing that happened is that the bromide fluid is very corrosive. And the and if you, and I'm just telling you what I read because this was not, uh, something that came up way late here. Uh, but the idea, what they think now is that this, these, there's like 10 mil silver rings that uh, uh, st strips that go between the housing and the float and it carries the current. And the thought is that what had happened is that somehow oxygen had gotten into that area into the bromide and it caused a corrosive action. So all the gyro is now are filled in a helium uh, nitrogen atmosphere. So, I mean, that, that's the only mode that anyone's seen it really as a close to failure mode. Cliff, you can read a question? Sure. Um, here's one. Um, uh, the question is how station keeping on Hubble is performed. I assume that's got to do with uh, orbit degradation or something like that, but I'll let the uh, panel answer. There is none. I mean, if there's no propulsion mechanism on it, that's like I think Jim was saying before, they boosted it at 380 miles and it's down about 330 now. And uh, it keeps dropping down. It'll eventually be pulled in by the atmosphere. And that's why they put the ring on it so that someone could be contracted to go up and grab one for the ring and bring them back. Probably stick them in the ocean, actually, but that's what they're going to do. Yeah, the, It's uh, coming down. Yeah, every, every maintenance mission, I believe, they did boost back up to make up for the accumulated drag. But since there is no more shuttle, uh, it'll have to be a robotic mission of some sort to go up and uh, uh, fire retro direction and like Hugh says, probably into the deep ocean. Here's a question. Has anyone compared the cost of orbital servicing with the cost of replacement? If over orbital servicing is so attractive, why hasn't it been adopted by the military for reconnaissance satellites? Well, part of the answer is, is, is designing something that's serviceable is very expensive and mounting shuttle missions to go up is very expensive. I think back when, uh, just my opinion, back when shuttle or when Hubble was first conceived, that was the time frame that the plan was to have uh, shuttle launches very cheap and have very, uh, uh, very often, and they'd be able to go out of Vandenberg and out of Kennedy. Well, that that never really happened. And I think uh, after that, that was that was a big reason. It just, it's, it's not cost effective. Uh, here's, a, here's a question that um, really didn't get a good answer. Somebody was wondering about CCDs. So uh, essentially it's an electro-optical question. Uh, what was put on the original um, what was put on the original telescope to, to sense uh, you know um, light essentially and uh, how good was it? Well th there was nothing on the spacecraft that's why we used the interferometer they used photomultiplier tubes. So the only one who uses CCDs was the scientists okay and uh, you know obviously that's why there's the wide field camera three right because, that uses the latest technology they could get at that time, going up to 2009. The original. But there are actually no CCDs. Yeah. The original wide field camera and the original uh, uh, faint object camera, I believe both used CCDs that were would have been a vintage of 
1980s vintage. But of course, as technology uh, uh, increased, you know, that's why they replaced the uh, instruments. Uh, and of course, when we had the Challenger disaster in late 80s, uh, all the science instruments were pulled off and were updated for later technology. Here's a question comparing the web to uh, the Hubble. Uh, what's going to happen to the Hubble after the web gets deployed? Well, the intent that I heard is to keep it going as, as a complement to each other because each one can see different wave bands. And, you know, so Hubble will go until they decide they don't want to fund it anymore because there's no way that Hubble, that the web can see above the IR. It's basically an infrared telescope. They're looking for those galaxies that are moving way away from us, okay? And we see the ones that are closer. I think it's like that composite picture I showed. They basically take the data from all the spacecraft, you know, all the satellites and put it together into composite image to see how much they can learn about astrophysics. Well, here's, here's kind of a two part question. Uh, I guess it's a compliment to the speakers. Uh, clearly, uh, says the questioner, we heard from first-rate engineering managers. That's you guys. Uh, I second that or third that. Um, and uh, I think it, the, the rest of the question is, what lessons should we learn from Challenger and Columbia? And what the, the questioner says here, Perkin Elmer's totally inaccurate manufacturing of the primary mirror. I guess I would, you know, that if that's a perception that the public has, uh, I probably need some correction somehow. So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that, but my understanding is a very, very, very subtle error. Well, the point is, is there's books written on this. So if you want to know about it, read the books. And there you the, go. Those are in panel discussions. Uh, I mean, people have looked in depth at what the problem is, and we would just be kind of, you know, hitting the surface, you know. Um, yeah, and I think uh, certainly, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of that information is on the web that has detailed explanation and you really need to be an optical uh, engineer to understand it. I don't understand it. I've looked at it, but, uh, but there, was, there were no, no hidden uh, agendas there, but they published everything that they found. Um, I, have, I have a comment on, on the James Webb versus Hubble. Hubble looks in the visible for the most part and the James Webb looks in the infrared. So I think those are complementary capabilities rather than the James Webb being a complete re replacement for the Hubble. But um, that's about all I know. Any comments on that? I, I think they overlap. Didn't somebody tell me that one of the challenges or problems with the web is that it has a limited life in the IR because it's a, a consumable material? No, I, I made a mistake when I said that. It really, it really hides behind a shade and it goes to 50. But the, life, the lifetime they predicted or hoped for is five and a half years. But it's like Hubble, you know, it can keep going if nothing fails. So how much did the prior Lockheed experiences on the KH-11 and earlier uh, satellite construction experience help the Hubble design? I think each of you can probably comment on that since you all were lucky before that. Before well, you had to work on the program you had mentioned. So I, I worked mainly on high altitude programs and a few other things like that. So we went over with the experience I had. So that it's not clear that anybody took anything off of any of the programs and brought them along. I mean, uh, Bill, I think Jim, uh, Jim mentioned the Agena. Jim worked the Agena. I was sort of a tail end of the Agena, but the other programs that you know, maybe most of us were not on. Okay. I think the uh, the the test equipment crew uh, had been on other other things, and of course we'd use the test facilities. And I mentioned the uh, computer and the uh, computer hardware uh, we already had, but everything else on Hubble was was very unique. Now the experience of people like you were invaluable on. Uh, coming up with, he had worked on digital control systems before, even though this one was totally different. Uh, so, so I think they brought the experience, but not, not really uh, 
any design per se. Another question for each of you is what's your favorite picture image from the Hubble? <laughs> Let's I like it. the butterfly. You like the butterfly. Jim, do you have a favorite? I, I don't think so. Hugh might. Um, probably the one no, he I, showed there. <laughs> well, I put that up with, because it was there. But, you know, I, I think there's so many pictures. If, if you're into astrometry, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's one that's favorite because each one always shows a different uh, facet of the astrometry. So I, I don't... It's not like you're taking a picture of your favorite baseball player or something. So. <laughs> I think one of the first ones that I, I liked was the very early uh, uh, pictures they had of Saturn. You know, you got a up close look at the rings. That was more of a, uh, I believe, more of a publicity photo than a, than a hard science, but still it was kind of an interesting picture. And that came out very early in the mission. Well, we're starting to run out of questions. We've got uh, several compliments and it's coming up on two hours. So uh, unless uh, Cliff- There's a couple of open questions. questions. I see one about the, there are pictures that are published that have jagged uh, shapes in the outline. I believe that's, Hugh, you can probably correct me. I believe that's cases where those are sewing together multiple images at different times. And so you end up with different different size pictures that you're piecing together. Is that correct? I don't know if it's correct, but I think that's the idea. I mean, we have dropped the resolution down. You know, we can command such small torques and send such rates that we basically eliminated any of the characteristics of the control system that could be seen in pictures. Hmm. We're well below the resolution to figure that out. Right, yeah, I think the picture, the jagged edges they're talking about in the question I think are the ones where they've pieced together several different uh, photos. And so you end up with different, different uh, field of view on the different photos. I have to fess up to a mistake that I made on the fifth servicing mission. <laughs> I knew the correct answer and somehow it didn't get changed, but the batteries were actually nickel hydrogen and not nickel cadmium. Nickel hydrate? Nickel hydrogen. Okay. Okay, well, I think it's probably a time to uh, end this webinar. Um, I really appreciate the efforts that uh, Jim, Cliff Gardner and Cliff and uh, Hugh put into uh, their presentations. Uh, the presentation is available on uh, YouTube Live on my channel, and ultimately it'll be cleaned up a bit and posted at the uh, uh, Technology Histories website. Uh, thank you guys, and uh, thank the audience for, for staying with us. Um, it's been very informative.